Art Collective. I'm speaking to you today from the unceded territory of the Lillooet and Squamish Nation. I'm going to say hi to each of our panelists and let them introduce themselves. So hello Dave. Hi, I'm Dave. I'm coming to you today from the unceded lands of the Wasanek, the Tamuk, and the Songhees people. I've had the privilege to be the Base Coast Art Grant Manager for the last four years. And I'm really excited today to share some of the behind the scenes process with the broader community. Thanks, Dave. Wangala. Hi, my name is Wangala and I'm speaking to you today also from Victoria, BC, and city territory of the Wasanek, Tumuk and Songhees peoples. I am uh, excited to be here uh, speaking on behalf of Time Nomads, which is my interactive art installation, which has traveled with me to Base Coast for three years in a row. Um, and yeah, very excited to speak about the opportunities that we can create with art. If you filled out a postcard and had it mailed to you, that is the project called Time Nomads. <laughs> Raven. Hi, I'm Raven Miniguns, speaking to you from Sixka Nation, Treaty 7, the traditional lands of my Blackfoot people. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us. Dave, Pepe, Petco. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, my and, partner, Tanya Kong. And we'd like to also acknowledge we are on Whistler, which is the shared traditional territory of the Coast Salish people of the Squamish First Nation. And the traditional territory of the Mount Curry Band of the Little Lot First Nation. Fantastic. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having us. <laughs> Rob. Hi, I am Robert Spring and I'm here in Vancouver and also the unceded traditional territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, the Stolo and the Squamish people. And I am uh, one member of the AR Sandscapes team, otherwise known as the Sandbox. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you for joining us. Really excited to talk to you about the opportunity of art. So originally this segment was called the responsibility of art asking the question, do artists have a responsibility to society? And we had the opportunity last week to meet together and bounce some ideas off each other. And the word opportunity rose to the surface of that conversation. And it really spoke to me so much so that we changed the entire direction of the panel conversation because everybody has a responsibility to society. But as artists, we have the opportunity to fulfill that responsibility through our art. So I'm gonna start by reading a quote from Eric Takashida. As artists wielding the powerful tool of creation, we must act with great responsibility. We must be cognizant of the power dynamics of our own rank, power, and privilege. When we do work that involves and impacts people, we must develop, cultivate, and hold ourselves and one another accountable to standards of practice for ethical behavior. So what that says to me is that when we exhibit in public places, we impact people. And that impact transcends time, space, language, culture, things that are normally barriers to communication. Art influences society. As Ginny Skies says, art can illuminate 
what lies hidden or repressed in the margins or the shadows. Our panelists today consist of artists that are involved in the Base Coast Art Grant exhibit. They range from being involved from year one, Pepe, one of our resident artists, to a first time artist who exhibited it with us last year, Raven. Everybody on this panel has demonstrated a deep responsibility to society through their work. So one of the biggest things that we've seen over the years is not only do we have an amazing creative culture within Base Coast, and we've got some really intentional artists, but we've had some people rise to the challenge of delivering art in a business model where they're able to bring their art to a broader community. And part of that is being professional and working with everybody else around them and making sure they're creating a safe environment for their art to be seen. So that, that's one of the reasons I'm so excited for showing today some of the, the highlights that we've had in the artistry of Base Coast. Yeah, so everybody on the panel has not only demonstrated a responsibility to society and a level of professionalism that we admire, but above all, everybody on the panel's art speaks for itself. You probably know their art, but you might not know the artists behind it. So this is an opportunity to get to know those artists and to share some stories. So thank you for joining us today. If you're in the chat room, so are we. Say hi, give us some flames, some emojis. We're all really excited to be here. Some of us have never done a panel. I've never moderated a panel before. So thanks for sharing this experience with us. And we hope that you gain something through it. And we wish we were all together. We do yeah. wish we were all together. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're going to dig in and get to know our panelists. Wangla is with us because she shows a very deep responsibility to social responsibility. Um, can you describe Time Nomads to us? Yeah, for sure. So Time Nomads is an interactive experience that essentially allows you to send a postcard to your future self. Um, so the intent is you would walk through, you know, all of the beautiful sites that we have at Base Coast and stumble upon my tiny little mailbox. And, um, and then you'll be able to kind of start to think about all of the experiences you've had at Base Coast and collect all of the feelings that we all, you know, love and get. Um, personally, for me, Base Coast is like my sanctuary. I go there every year and I feel the most like myself. And uh, so I always kind of think about it as like sending a message from your kinder self to your future self. Uh, so what it does is it, it, it hopes to um, discover two prominent issues that we have in Canada, one of them being mental health and the other one being cultural identity. So when we're at these festivals and we're all um, in a very uplifting and sun-kissed environment, um, it's really easy to forget how we feel in the winters uh, when all of these opportunities aren't around us to uplift us. And so the, the point is actually to capture that happiness that you've created for yourself um, all by yourself and then send it to your future so that you get to have that self-reflection down the line. And that self-reflection is really beneficial for your mental health. Um, but all in all, it's also just being self-aware is going to be beneficial for everybody around you. It's not just for you. So um, that's what it kind of goes into looking at. Uh, it started out with me just writing postcards to myself every time I traveled. And then every time I found myself in these euphoric um, places that, you know, your mind can take you in beautiful festivals, then uh, you want to kind of record that and, and save it for as long as you can. Amazing. Well, thank you for sharing this project with the Base Coast community. I know thousands of people have interacted it over, over the years. You've been with us. But this is going to be your fourth year? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank Raven, you. we've invited you to the panel because we feel you have a deep responsibility um, to the environmental core values um, that you hold in yourself. Can you share with us uh, ghost stories in your process? Okay. So Ghost Stories um, is a conceptual sculpture I made out of paper, book paper, and it was suspended in the forest um, with the light illuminating from the top of it. I feel like a lot of times through like my art, 
I'm a catalyst for those things that can't speak to us and tell their own stories. So I find myself gravitating a lot towards trees in my own personal art. And so with this specific piece, I was connecting humans, the materials, and where the materials are sourced from to all together into a triangular kind of motion. Um, so what I did was I went out into the environment, into the world, into the urban city, and I found books that were not from like Valley Village, that were not brand new. I found books that were legitimately thrown into the garbage. Um, and these books would never ever be read again. And it's kind of a sad, a sad existence for a book, especially because they're crisp books, they're clean books. Um, and this tree had given its life to be a book, to be the paper, to be read, to have the messages on the paper brought onto us. But these books were destined to never be read again, to sit in the landfill. So I went and found a handful of books and I sat down and I ripped each page out one by one. And then I ripped each page in pieces one by one <laughs> and I put them in a big bowl and put some water in the bowl <laughs> and then I blended them up. And at that point I had that pulpy paper back. Um, and so I created my own little paper pulling device and I pulled the long pieces of paper. So I started like small and it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It was five rings. And then I attached each ring with sinew to this um, apparatus, this grid-like apparatus I made from sticks I found on the way to Base Coast by one on one of the <laughs> <laughs> on one of the um, very beautiful lakes. It was like ten minutes away from Base Coast. So beautiful, so much sticks on the beach. So I took some of there, made the apparatus, hung it sinew and then lit it from the top so wow and then Incredible. when you lit it from the top the shadows yeah the shadows so that's the ghost <laughs> those are the ghost stories um it's kind of like a mildly interactive sculpture I find um, because you're not really aware that you're interacting with this piece that's hanging above you as much as you are. What it is to me is I'm giving those books that never ever had a chance to be like appreciated again, those trees that gave their lives, they were never going to be appreciated again, never to be experienced again. Um, I gave those trees their last kind of last hurrah, I guess, with humans and you would stand underneath the sculpture and the rings did make a shadow of tree rings onto the ground that got rather large and kind of resembled the ancient trees and how big they used to be. Uh, I love the story so much, Raven. I think the idea that you were talking about the other day of bringing the story of an object that has been relegated to never be seen again and back out and getting it to tell its story again is so amazing. Like the, mm -hmm. the concept was so beautiful, but I've always wondered because this was your first year at Base Coast. What, what made you decide to bring your art to the Base Coast community? What, what made you decide to share that part with us? Well, um, the simplest way to put it is public art. And so I feel coming from a fine arts background, I went to school for six years for fine arts to go into a gallery-like setting um, that speaks to people that have that vocabulary of fine artists. And that takes kind of education to get into. Um, what I wanna do is bring that fine art kind of metaphysical, subconscious type of, uh, art into the public realm and what better place to do it than in a place of like-minded people 
That's beautiful. The depth of your work is so inspiring. The fact that it came from these books that would never be read again. It's cast into paper, which casts the shadow of tree rings. And then after the festival, you also have a closure process. With I do. Um, <laughs> so since I didn't add any of the chemicals that you can add into the paper to make it to make it bind and to make it flow properly into pages. I just use the paper, book paper and then water and that's it. Um, I gathered up all the pieces of paper that made up my piece and I brought them back to my reserve, Sixica Nation. Uh, and then into the Bow River, I just like slowly put each piece of paper, watch them disintegrate away and then they're back in to the universe, I suppose. That's incredible. What a process. Um, yeah, I'm, it's so inspiring. And I think everybody could only dream of having that much depth to their work. So <laughs> thank you for sharing your story with us. Dave, Dave has been with us since year one. Uh, as the art director for Base Coast, if I need advice, I ask Dave. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for joining us today, Dave. Thanks, Liz. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've been, you've done Slay Bay. You've created Slay Bay. You've toured with the Guild. You've done art grants. You've been involved in basically anything visual. Dave's had a had a piece of it. And Dave's real talent. The reason I go to him is because not only does it, not only is it incredible art, but he's got a very unique cool to his art. Everything he touches just looks yeah. badass. <laughs> Um, it's a very, uh, very incredible style and I really admire your commitment to your life as an artist. I wouldn't say art is something you do in your pastime. I think you are art. Art is you. 24 seven, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, last year you and Tanya brought to us the monolith of smiles. Um, can you explain, and for people that don't know which one that was, it was the tower of skulls. Can you explain your process with the skulls? Uh, well, I collect skulls. I have a bunch of skulls at home. Um, I have one human skull that is not real. I wish it was, but it's a medical grade replica. Uh, it's plastic. And um, basically that skull I had made a mold of years ago. And we had the skull at home. Uh, Tanya was at home one day and she painted the teeth all fluorescent day glow colors. So um, we talked about maybe doing something for Base Coast. So I, I, our, our idea was a, a 12 foot tall monolith of concrete skulls. Uh, I took the one skull that I already made a mold of and I made six other molds of that skull. Um, any leftover mold making material, silicone, uh, we cast a tiny little um, fetus, skull, fetus skull, <laughs> baby fetal skull. skull, baby skull. Yeah, just because <laughs> we had extra and I didn't want to throw it out. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> with those, say, seven skulls plus the two little baby skulls or skull molds, we cast uh, with recycled grout, like for tiles, uh, 235 concrete skulls or grout skulls. And then we painstakingly painted by hand each individual tooth. It turned out, worked out to be about 7,500 teeth. <laughs> Took a very long time. It was every day yeah. after work, before work, painting teeth, casting, molding, pulling out. Some of the molds did not want to come out of the silicon and it was. Yeah, great. they started falling apart. They're good for a couple <laughs> hundred castings and then that's it, really. Right. Yeah, we used them till the very end. We're still using them. Well, like always, an incredible dedication to your craft, um, which was, it was nice to see you partner with Tanya. And there is a lot of death that happens in our community that's happened in recent years. And the tower became a, a symbol of that. And I think people resonated with that. Um, we did have a family death in the Base Coast community right before the event. So it became in a way a sort of a memorial. Um, Tanya, you, there was a connection to grief and death with the piece. Um, do you feel comfortable yeah. talking about that? 
I would love to talk about it because I think it was, for me, it was a very personal experience that I wanted to share and kind of, I guess, communicate the message that we're all in this together. And we, you know, these, the idea of death to me really came to life. Is that a way, can I even say that? <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think that's beautiful. <laughs> um, while we were, so, I mean, the whole process of making the project was, Took about five months. Yeah, it took about five months. And like, I think it all came together very like serendipitously and beautifully. And we had started making it, making the skull molds and they're sitting all over our house, you know, with skulls staring back at me every day. And um, a few months into making the project, um, one of my really close friends passed away. And it wasn't just any kind of death it was um an intentional one and uh i don't think i'd ever experienced death in such a like personal way i mean i had my grandparents pass away but i didn't know them that well and it was sad but like for me this was the first time that somebody that i loved and i cherished and had a personal connection with um was no longer a part of the physical life and so i just my mind in its off time just went into all kinds of places exploring this idea of death and um, what what is our purpose and our meaning in the physical life and I guess mainly how do we maximize that meaning um, while we can, while we have our physical wherewithal and our ability to communicate and make art. Um, so, and also the year that we had created the monolith of smiles was also the theme of duality at base coast. Mm -hmm. um, so what greater duality, I don't know if that was serendipitous, that was also a serendipitous <clears throat> connection, but what greater duality yeah, is there than death. death and life? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it was this like beautiful um, intersection of these like random ideas that came together very perfectly and so I wrote up a little write-up that went with the monolith. And it, I mean, it's, it essentially said that I felt that our number one purpose on this life um, is to find our peace and our happiness um, through whatever journey that we might be going through. And I think everybody has a journey. I think everybody has something that they're struggling with. Um, and to work with that struggle and try to find your best self and your best state of being, the best version of yourself using those experiences in life. Um, and then there were other meetings which um, also came into my heart and my mind and my soul while this was all happening was, um, I think that someone when they, when they go away and they you know, leave this physical life, I believe and I still feel like I still feel my friend's presence. Um, she was an artist herself, a prolific photographer, um, made beautiful art and it's all over her house. And every time I see it, it inspires me, you know, and, and every time I see nature um, with the sun, you know, twinkling in the water, it reminds me of her. And so I like to think that these people that have passed still live on in many, many ways. Um, and I think that it's our duty as physical beings to create moments and art um, that continue to inspire uh, beyond your physical life, which was really beautiful. Well, yeah. I mean, there's so much to say to that. A, it's like sometimes the opportunity of art, we don't even know what it is. Sometimes it presents itself to us halfway through a process or after the process. Also, when, when different people are experiencing art, it means something different to everybody. And that's what's so great about exhibiting in a public space in a public space is that you get to interact with people and hear how they're experiencing your piece of work and and sharing those stories i'm sure everybody on the panel has had a moment of epiphany when somebody is experiencing your art and explaining to you how they're feeling you're like oh wow never i never thought of it like that so and the other point that i want that, i mean the serendipitous moments at base coast they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we love it. <laughs> it's just that unexplainable synchronicity that we're all a part of. And yeah, so you thanks know, I, for acknowledging that. I always wondered, Tanya, you know, I think that your piece not only was beautiful, both you and Dave, but but it 
because it became that center point of kind of catharsis for the community, did you take anything home with that? Did that did that affect you afterwards that you weren't expecting, or was it positive? Did you feel that love coming back with you? I didn't expect. Well, I didn't expect people to kind of connect with it in such a quiet way. Like I thought people would be like, "Whoa, that's a tower of skulls with fluorescent teeth. That's so rad." But people were actually <laughs> like, like it was like a point of yeah, quiet um, reflection and yeah. That was that was really cool. Yeah. I took back, I took back a lot of love from the community, from people that said they appreciated just the 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 space that we made for them, where they could go and just you know in the daytime in the nighttime, uh, you know j just go and and Chill be out. at peace almost. Yeah. 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 Great. Well, thanks for sharing your story and that experience with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, Rob, augmented reality. Uh, I explain you as just being, your team as being ahead of your time, I think. Now you're starting to see this pop into our world and exhibits more often, but you've been at this for a while. And the reason that we asked you to join the panel, obviously we love the piece. We all spend time there. Um, but it's the opportunity of art to educate. Um, so we're, can you explain the augmented reality as, as an opportunity to educate us is what, how it works? Sure, so the genesis of this uh, collaboration with, uh, with my team started, um, you know, a bunch of years ago when it, yeah, my first Base Coast, I saw this amazing art, you know, that our friends Mark and Neil had made and, uh, and I just wanted to be a part of a team that did that. I don't have any artistic skills per se, but uh, I started volunteering with them for a couple of years. And then, you know, I saw more of that at, at Burning Man. And then my friends, we went to Shambhala and we saw this sandbox. And it turns out that there's this guy that developed all the software, put up all the designs for free online. And I thought, man, what an opportunity here to give to bring this to Base Coast and just have this awesome toy there. Well, at its foundation, what it is, it's a, it's a tool to teach children, essentially, you know, uh, what topographic maps are and, you know, basic geography elements. So that it's an educational tool at its very, at its most basic level. It also has, you know, these cooperative elements and, um, you know, little secrets people can find, you know, whether it's the buttons that change the color schemes and the life animation that uh, my team member, Patrick Fletcher, developed that, that shows how life, you know, uh, uh, populates different terrains and environments, gives us an opportunity to explain, you know, extremophiles and, uh, and other like biological elements within the piece and also in a music festival environment it just melts people's brains as soon as they put their hands you know in the sand and realize that they're changing it and the water and the making it rain and all that kind of stuff it's it's also this tactile like soothing thing that's that you know when you're in between stages to take a break at uh and each year uh, you know just in our our own education we want to level up our skills as a team and our creativity every year. So it started as this real basic box that we just kind of got all the technological elements together. And, uh, and then Patrick started developing all this code and all this amazing stuff. And then uh, another friend, Mark, came on board, who's, who's an amazing woodworker and 3D printer guy. And he was like, oh, I'll build you a better cabinet because I built the first one that kind of sucked. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. We painted it black. So that helped, you know, cover up all the, all the blemishes. But, um, and then after that, you know, other people started to want to come on board just the way that in the same way that I experienced, uh, you know, starting out with Mark and Neil on their Of Trees projects, our friends, Justin and Kate came on and they're very talented people as well. And we were going to build a whole, a space this year around the patterns and playing with shadows and then also having a much bigger dance floor um, than we did last year, where instead of you playing with sand, 
you are the sand. You're in the box. <laughs> so it was going to be like a 16 by 10. <laughs> we did a 12 by 9 space last year, and it was really dusty, and it didn't. It worked as a as a proof of concept. But this year it was going to be a six, uh, 16 by 10, and then with other elements in it as well. And so that's that's the genesis of it. It's the education opportunity. You know, I think you touched on it, Liz, where you see people have that moment with your piece. And I get to have that over and over and over again at Base Coast, which is so incredible. You know, when people realize that they that they, they're interacting with it, that what they're doing is creating their own art piece at Base Coast. And, uh, and we've included a couple of secrets. Like um, there's a quote, I won't ruin it now because you'll have to come back to Base Coast and find it, but I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you. There's a quote at the bottom of the box and you need to get help to uncover it literally from the sand <laughs> and then figure out what it says. Um, Amazing. Yeah, so with the, with the education opportunity, people, are, people often ask, you know, how does this work? You know, and I get to explain, you know, not just what it's for, but like, you know, you could build this yourself. It's all online. It's not super complicated um, to do, like if you just follow the instructions and you can have this at your school, at your science center. When we first started this five years ago, there was maybe 50 of these boxes in the world. Now there's hundreds. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things about art is that it can engage children and adults in ways that traditional forms of education just don't. Um, there's so many opportunities for education. Thank you so much for sharing that experience. One of the things you touched on is, um, I kind of wanted to talk to Raven about I have a quote here, um, art reflects your community values and it helps us to understand others' points of view. And so Raven, do you find that when you install your work, it starts a dialogue with festival attendees where you can start to talk to them about your process or your environmental responsibility? Like, people have a lot of conversations on your art. I saw a lot of people sitting and having conversations. Did you interact with them at all or? What's the dialogue like when you're standing next to your art and then you're watching people experience your art? I feel like if they had the awareness that of what the material is made out of, the conversation would go towards consumption, I would hope. Yeah, definitely. Does anybody else have anything to speak to that? That is that your art creates dialogue with attendees, especially in a festival setting. Yeah, I'm like always lurking and seeing what people are up to and trying to see if they figured it out because because um, it is just like a little mailbox and you have to read the very obscure open me to get in there and then read the instructions. But a lot of the time people don't go through all that effort to read at that at, at, like at festivals. So um, what I love doing is standing around and hearing the people who've discovered what it does eagerly trying to share that information with the next person mm -hmm. and so like I don't really ha I don't really tell them it's mine or anything like that I just I just like stand there and I just watch people get excited over this thing and and try to share it with each other as much as possible um, because of like budget reasons as well as just it's uh, really just me who runs the whole project like my mailbox is super tiny and hidden and you have to kind of stumble upon it and um, over time, I've also kind of discovered that like the more um, of an open area I try to put it in, like if I'm trying to focus as much attention to it as possible, then I don't really get the postcards that I, I want. Um, a lot of it will just be stuff like Happy Base Coast, which is cute. I love it. Um, but there's other opportunities that get way deeper and stuff. And I almost feel like uh, if they stumble upon it and then uh, a lot of the times it's like also like telling their friends in camps and then that friend has to like do a little scavenger hunt to find it and such. Mm -hmm. um, and then even like limiting the number of postcards I do will get people, I, I, I release more and more towards the end of the festival because like my intention is that they are learning something about themselves in this weekend and not really just, I love, I love the idea of them also putting their intentions on what could happen, but a lot of the time I want it to be more of a reflective tool that they can use at the end. So yeah, like I absolutely love <laughs> standing around 
literally everybody's art though. Like as soon as I figure something out as well, I'm going to think I'm the genius and everybody needs to hear <laughs> about this thing I figured out. So Rob, I cannot wait until I figure it out what's on the bottom of your box. <laughs> like, <laughs> But I've got to say with this group, it's interesting to have, you know, Dave, who's been here 12 years, Rob and Wangela five, six years now, six and years. Raven seven, and Raven with your year one. You know, er everyone's piece of art, I always learn so much in discussing with you. Now, I, I get the privilege of seeing your applications and they're so beautifully written and you've got so much intention into them and I see what goes into your art. My personal bit now is I want everyone to get that. I, I want everyone to be able to do the round where we do almost like an art grant tour of the festival for everybody who's within it. And I, I think that's gonna be, you know, going forward in the next few years, that's the big exposure piece now for us is that we're gonna do an art grant tour we're going to make it so that everybody gets the opportunity to talk about the intention of their art. Because not only is it a visual interactive piece, it's learning about it. And I know Liz will talk about this now. Raven and I, or, or sorry, Liz and I both loved Raven's piece. I can't stop talking about her. No, we can't <laughs> stop talking about the piece. <laughs> and, and for me, having the conversation even afterwards, I loved your piece from the get-go when I saw it on the proposal. I loved your materials. I loved your intention. I didn't know until last week that you took your piece and you put it in the water and you gave it back. Like to yeah. me, that closes the loop of a truly sustainable art piece that had so much meaning. I, I just, I think everyone's got something to say about that because all of you have brought art you've made it sustainable for Bay's Coast, you've been true to yourself as an artist. So I, I don't know if anyone's got any, anything to say about that, you know, about bringing our community deeper into the art that you're bringing. Yeah, I mean, I have wanted my partner, Patrick, to give a presentation on his contribution to our piece, because he's the, I, I, you know, I say often, he's the brainiac, I'm the maniac, right? <laughs> he, he is, he is such an incredible mind for what he's done with our piece. And I've always wanted him to speak, like have a little presentation of the brain, you know, and this year he was like, he was into the idea. He's a natural educator. Um, I feel. And, uh, and I was really looking forward to him just giving a talk about what this whole thing is for him uh, to people. Cause I'm often the forward facing person on our project, but Patrick is like the real brains behind the whole thing. So um, to hear him talk about sort of the math aspect that that he brings to it and, and so on and that and I would love to see that with everybody's everybody's piece it would be an incredible opportunity I think for the base coast community at large to see oh this is what it takes you know this this is what is uh, what it takes to get in because I often get that question you know with people who are like oh I want to bring some to base coast how do I do that and then you know, it'd be it'd be an incredible tool to further the uh, the art and raise the level up again, like it gets every year with with the contributions. Well, I think um, we've and just we've discovered some new opportunities here. <laughs> um, I think for people listening to who have applied, um, a lot of people are starting to apply each year, and we just can't accept everybody. So I think hearing about these depths and these layers behind the art of artists who are contributing and year after year, everybody on this panel was accepted into this year's show. Is there any, is there any advice you can give for people who are starting out who maybe they don't, they have a passion for art, but they don't know what that deeper connection is to the opportunity of social responsibility, environmental responsibility. How do you, where was the link between those for you? Do you have any advice for people? Raven, I saw you nodding your head. Yeah, for sure. So one of my favorite teachers and me were having a conversation. It was in my last year of school. So I went from in school, I went from going in to art college, which is now a university, to being a tattoo artist. Um, to totally changing and becoming a glassblower to realizing the consumption it takes to be a glassblower. 
to switching off to conceptual sculpture um, because then I could speak about that environmental consciousness and that relationship. Um, so in my last semester, it's kind of like getting stuck, like what is a sculpture? What does a sculpture do for the public? And like, why am I making a sculpture for these people to view it? So basically what a sculpture is, what all art is, what art that helps change and transform um, a person's way of thinking um, does is so it comes from a molecular, like the molecular makeup of you, the viewer, going in to um, an installation or a sculpture, going into the same environment, that molecular structure of the intention behind the art piece actually affects your molecular structure and on a subconscious and conscious level you walk away totally changed whether or not you know it so i think that's really important to know like the all of the pieces and aspects of your art piece will change somebody or hopefully the better like it's always a growing thing with art <laughs> yeah that was beautifully said um i know with the art that we do at base coast like we feel a responsibility to inspire people to have fun you know mm -hmm. to walk into our environment and to unplug from the responsibilities that they normally feel and that in itself is a is an opportunity so i i really resonate with what you're saying is that your art will represent what your core values are and the hierarchy of your core values. It will just come out in your art. Like you said, it's a molecular thing. It will also come out in how you appreciate other people's art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love how that resonates back into the opportunity and responsibility. You have the opportunity to bring your core values out and to have them seen. But you've got that responsibility because you know that what you bring out is going to change people. I yeah. like to think of it as like mm. inspiring people to find the best version of themselves or to experience the best experience. Sometimes people get a new idea um, or maybe they never thought about the life cycle of, of, the, of what they make art with. And then now it's injected into their consciousness and they're aware of, of how they live their day-to-day -day lives. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. I like the whole concept of using recycled and upcycled material. And the Liz, you actually turned me on to this when you left me alone with a whole bunch of chandeliers and light work, light lamp works <laughs> for the pirate ship. And you're like, Pepe, this is your kit. And I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? I no really idea. And got creative. Yeah, I got creative with that. It was amazing. I, I don't like throwing away stuff into the dump or the trash. I'd rather recycle and I'd rather upcycle and, you know, make art out of junk, really. Yeah, I, I like that concept of um, being conscious of the life cycle of the materials that you're using. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 If I could just uh, speak to the advice part for someone who maybe wants to put together a successful art grant. Um, you know, my, my experience was, um, you know, you have to, you have to have a, a budget. You have to figure out how you're going to work that and having a, a Did you just a, say the well, B word to a bunch of artists? I did. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> I put it, you know, manager. with my team, I'm the one that puts it together. Right. And, and deals with the funding and stuff. So, you know, we have to have a crystal clear vision of what we're going to put together then be able to communicate that in a way that isn't you know conceptual in a sense it's you know is because it's very sometimes difficult for people to uh write what exactly their art piece is not what it'll be or what it represents or you know like that it's you know so that dave and liz can have an, a, a firm idea of what you're actually building and then how you're actually going to do it yeah and the more concise and specific you can be the more I think, the more successful you'll be at your art grant. You know, what? and if you're if you're struggling conceptually with what you're going to do, what I did is I started volunteering on crews, just hammering nails, screwing things in, 
getting the lay of the land, I just volunteered on my friend's team and helped them set up and tear down for a couple of years before I got inspired, you know, to do what we do now. Yeah, I just, uh, if you're not there for teardown, you weren't really there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. I love the snaps, Wangela. It, it's one of those things, you know, as a team, I, I think everybody on this call has understood there are limitations to bringing art to the public. You, you might have a vision that will cost three times what somebody can afford. And, and Base Coast has done an amazing job. Liz and the girls have done a fantastic job to create funding to bring this public to the art. And it's working within that budget. We all do it. And, and I've been really impressed with everybody on this call of, you might not always get what you want, but how do you then make sure that your vision is still seen? And it is still true to you. I, I think everybody on this call has done that. They, they've made sure that their art is true to them, no matter what what's available. And that, that means that you're able to grow year after year. You're able to work within what's available. And, and we all do it. I, I bring my, my lefty brain of, of being an engineer into it all the time, right? But truly, we all have an aspiration that we want but we're limited by what we can do sustainably. And and that happens to every level of production. I mean, that's happening to me constantly with my own budgets. <laughs> um, so we've got to start to wrap this up. I wanted to touch on one more point um, with Juan Gala and your connection to the Black Lives Matter movement and how your project has evolved. Awesome, yeah, definitely. I'd be very happy to speak about this. Um, so like I've already spoken about Time Nomads, Global Nomads, it's dedicated to talking about the most difficult conversations or you know, trying to make ourselves more aware about what's going on in the world. And um, 2020 is messed up. <laughs> so many <laughs> things have gone wrong that could go wrong. And one of the ones that have come super close to what I care about, and I know what a lot of people who always attend Base Coast care about, is the current Black Lives Matter movement. And so in an effort to encourage people to keep themselves accountable, I've um, temporarily created Black Lives Matter postcards. And the intention of this is that we are writing ourselves future postcards, nothing much has changed here. Um, but this time what we're trying to do is um, figure out ways how we can continue to have these conversations and to educate ourselves. And so, um, yeah, so if you could, uh, you know, if you are a part of the movement right now and you're feeling a little worried that you're slowing down because your energy is being depleted or there's a different trend, there's all these different reasons that will stop us from having these important conversations, then this is one of the ways that you can contribute while actually actively contributing to um, the funds that are needed. So uh, currently 50% of the profits will be going to um, a variety of community uh, funds for the Black Lives Matter movements, including for um, Black Lives Matter in Vancouver. And the intent, again, is that you just go on there, you type a message to your future self to remind you of ways to remain an ally in these anti-racist crisis times. Um, and then while you wait for your postcard to come, you should continue to educate yourself and support um, other Black, Indigenous, and uh, persons of color voices, um, encourage their uh, businesses, and then you'll be receiving your postcard on um, uh, an original Global Nomads postcard, the Black Lives Matter edition. Um, and so by the time you receive that, uh, there's like little things you can do to inspire yourself on what you want to say to yourself. Um, that could be stuff from doing research or finding new Instagram accounts to follow that are uh, supporting BIPOC movements. Um, creating recurring donations. There's so many things that we can do. Um, and this one is the first move to keeping yourself accountable and aware of the ongoing conversations. Uh, so yeah, I invite anybody, globalnomadsart.com slash Black Lives Matter and uh, be happy to hear from you all. <laughs> so we will make sure that that link is in the Twitch chat that's going on beside this panel discussion. 
thank you everybody for joining us and sharing your stories. We're so inspired by all of you. We hope that you all continue to contribute and watching the evolution of each of you as artists in our show has been an honor. It really has been. Um, and with that, we'd like to thank everybody who joined us online, who's been participating in the chat room. We are so sorry that we're not together physically, but we are always together with those deep connections that we all have to each other through the Base Coast community. Until we gather again, stay safe and goodbye. Love you all. I have goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>
sort of alternative way of accessing magic in this fucked up world is a reality. It's still there. It's not, it's not made up. <laughs> it's a safe place for us to come and express ourselves and be together. Um, attention and love and detail that's gone to it, it really makes me appreciate everything else and all of my other friends. So this, this, you know, this music festival that we, we work together on and we all put an effort into, it's, it's made up of these hundreds and hundreds of moving parts and every single person. So much creativity that just like is bursting out of everyone and everyone. Like, it nourishes my soul because I- And watching one of your friends perform, that's so special too. Because you're kind of like bursting with pride at what your friends have uh, achieved. Um, the volunteers that you end up meeting and just, these people have no... Yeah. It's up like half of the year. It's way more than one weekend. Yeah, yeah. And once a year that flower gets to blossom, you know? Actually have that one-on-one -on -one quality time and camp with a bunch of your friends and just the hilarity that ensues late at night. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> the future is yours. This zone, we're in deep. We are in deep, deep, deep. So smart, look at all your butts. I'm so learned. Oh no, definitely not. No, it's not over. <laughs> not over. So, I consider them a close friend. Yeah, there's people at Base Coast in the Base Coast world, I'm sure would prefer that they don't they don't speak with me. <laughs> but it's still nice when we see each other from across the room. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> we can do football stance. <laughs> and break. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.